For today, uh, we have three rounds, as uh, Pablo mentioned. Uh, during the first round, uh, I will present the state of the art of port accessibility, uh, the factors that uh, influence port accessibility. Uh, for instance, water level factors, well, ship related factors, and finally, the factors that are related to bottom and to maintenance. Uh, and uh, after, after a small break, I think around 15 minutes, uh, I will uh, pick off the second round where I will share uh, the results of uh, ongoing research activities. Uh, I will present uh, Magnet and Prisma, which are basically uh, also research platforms for sharing the research and for doing research together. Uh, and uh, it's a nice combination of uh, fundamental knowledge and applied knowledge. Uh, and uh, four research lines are targeted by Magnet and Prisma. It is navigation through math that I previously mentioned. We develop in new surveying techniques uh, in fluid math and very diluted uh, sediment layers. Uh, we test different dredging techniques for port maintenance. So water injection dredging was tested quite actively. Uh, and uh, finally, I will, uh, well, I will present a few slides on reallocation uh, of sediment for beneficial reuse of sediment. And I hope to have also very productive uh, discussion with you after that during the question section. To start with, um, to start with port accessibility. Okay. To start with port accessibility, uh, there are different types of port accessibility. For example, it could be economic accessibility, environmental accessibility. But uh, in this presentation, I will discuss uh, really logistical accessibility, how to bring the cargo on land. Huh? So to start uh, with, uh, uh, with access to the sea and uh, bringing also cargo safely to, to the doors locations. There is also uh, port accessibility uh, through hinterland. Uh, uh, also that, uh, that, that, that accessibility covers the link between uh, land transport and uh, waterborne transport. I won't cover this part but I will mainly focus on the accessibility from the sea. And uh, there are three main factors that influence this accessibility, well, water level, ship related, and uh, bed level factor. Uh, uh, what do we know from the state of the art for the port accessibility? Now there is a uh, well, Pianc report on the harbor approach channels uh, design and guidelines. And uh, it covers all the three factors in depth. Uh, well, water level factors include uh, tidal offset uh, during transit and maneuvering, uh, and uh, also allowances for unfavorable, condi unfavorable conditions like uh, well, for waves, uh, additional tolerance that uh, is added to, to this water level factor. Uh, another set of factors, the ship-related factor, uh, that includes uh, static uh, draft. Uh, and uh, this draft is well, basically the draft that is designed for the vessel. And in addition to draft, it includes uh, underkill clearance. Uh, and uh, if you talk about underkill clearance, we mainly talk about gross underkill clearance. And that includes also different sort of tolerance uh, like, like a change in water density, for example. Uh, also, the factors that, uh, that are related to dynamics of the vessel, like uh, squat, dynamic beam, dynamic heel, and so on. And finally, well, net under Q clearance, is, um, that is a tolerance initially uh, designed for, yeah, for the vessel. And the third, uh, factors, bottom related factors that is uh, also uh, pretty much linked to, to, to the maintenance of, uh, of, the, of the bottom of the harbor. Uh, and uh, these factors include uh, 
uh, well, sounding and sediment and sort, uh, sediment conditions and certain this uh, because uh, of the sediment, well, as you know, of course, in the harbors doesn't have a flat bottom. Uh, and uh, well, that should be also included in this tolerance for port accessibility. Uh, uh, also, dredging execution tolerance and uh, allowances for bottom changes between dredging, uh, those two are, are very well linked to, to the dredging operations. Uh, to start with, uh, what is the state of the art for port accessibility for water level? Uh, I would start with uh, these tides. Uh, ports uh, are using tidal windows uh, to ensure that uh, the that ships with a bigger draft uh, could uh, enter the harbor and uh, come to the birth location. Uh, yesterday, during his lecture, uh, Mark uh, also showed this image that I think illustrates perfectly uh, this, uh, this tidal window uh, during the high waters. Uh, accessibility of harbor uh, is uh, improving, and uh, this is the time, the perfect time when uh, big draft vessels could enter the port and go to the terminal. Uh, in addition, current velocities could influence uh, maneuverability of the vessels, uh, and uh, uh, the velocities could be also considered for the tidal window. And uh, therefore, when we talk about tidal windows, uh, we discuss uh, vertical tidal, tidal windows that uh, depend on the water level and uh, also on the bottom of the canal or the port, and the horizontal tidal window that are mainly related to maneuverability of uh, the vessels and uh, the, the speed of the currents. Uh, here is another good illustration how this uh, a uh, tidal window can be used for inbound ships. So as we see, uh, well, the water level is quite high in the beginning and uh, the, the inbound ship can use successfully uh, this tidal window to, to enter the harbor. And, uh, the same also hold for outbound, out, outbound ships uh, when they leave the harbor uh, also at a pretty high uh, water level. All these are available if uh, ports have a very good data set. Yesterday, Mark also showed uh, that nowadays ports, especially in Europe, are busy with collecting lots of different information. And uh, this information could be really useful for, for further analysis and uh, optimization uh, of different operations like uh, dredging, for instance, uh, also navigation, uh, also managing tidal windows. And this is an example of uh, uh, hydrometeor uh, data that is available, publicly available uh, online. Uh, Port of Rotterdam is having several stations that are allocated uh, in the port area. Uh, and uh, this data is called collected live. And uh, also historical data is available, uh, and therefore more research uh, is triggered by this data, more data-driven research for further analysis. Now I switch to shift factors. Uh, first, to introduce several, uh, several important aspects for shift factors. I already mentioned draft. And uh, there are different types of draft. Well, I would like to highlight a few. Uh, first of all, is designed to draft for a vessel. Uh, this draft is typically, uh, well, uh, spoken uh, when uh, the car, when the ship is fully loaded. There is also actual draft of a vessel. Uh, then that means, well, this draft is it's uh, smaller than design draft. Uh, and it's uh, actually uh, the draft uh, with, the best, with the actual vessel, with the, uh, with, with the cargo. So the, the draft the vessel actually has loaded to. Uh, and uh, finally, the draft for which a channel was designed. Uh, and this is the draft, uh, well, in the channel itself. It's a maximum draft for, yeah, for 
for accessibility in a certain channel. Uh, and uh, of course, it should be well also a trade off between the draft, uh, actual draft, and also the draft of the channel itself. And when we talk about underkill clearance, uh, there are also several notations for underkill clearance. I already mentioned gross underkill clearance that uh, includes uh, all type of uncertainties, uh, water density, dynamics of the vessel itself, uh, and net underkill clearance, and so on. Uh, and there is also deterministic underkill clearance. Uh, and uh, deterministic underkill clearance uh, is based on uh, experience from the past, because uh, because uh, well, uh, port authorities also the contact series of pilots, and based on these pilots, they could uh, create they could uh, uh, estimate uh, uh, the certain margin that is considered to be safe, and uh, that 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 approach is normally uh, called deterministic underkill clearance. And uh, finally, there is a dynamic underkill clearance. And uh, this underkill clearance is based on live measurements and data and predictions. So this is the most, well, the heaviest from scientific point of view because uh, there is a lot of data connected, uh, collected for, for dynamic underkill clearance and, of course, prediction model. Um, what are other factors are included in uh, ship-related factors? Uh, first of all, it's a uh, it's a water density uh, because uh, buoyancy of the vessel well, uh, differs with, with density of water, and uh, uh, well, you, you, perhaps you've seen a so-called uh, Plimsoll mark on the vessel. So this mark also shows uh, the draft of the vessel in a uh, is a fresh water, so you see it's a water or tropical water or saline or tropical fresh. Uh, so there is a different draft of the vessel depending on the, yeah, on the water density. Uh, also dynamic parameters of the vessels. Uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, well, uh, dynamics of the vessel, it's a sinkage, of course, and uh, trim that are indicated on the top right corner. And uh, squat, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of these two. And uh, therefore, this dynamic trim could be included in squat, and a certain tolerance uh, well, should be given uh, because uh, normally at bow, uh, the distance between the bottom and uh, the ship keel is uh, smaller, which is, which is also de depends on the velocity of the vessel. Um, also, uh, six degrees of freedom. Uh, well, during well, weight induced vessel motion. So, uh, this, uh, this, this, this basically should be also calculated to wave response allowances. And, uh, well, now it brings me, my presentation brings me to port accessibility bed level. This is the final factor uh, that uh, I, will be dis I will be discussing during this lecture. Uh, as you know, uh, ports are designed for certain type of the vessels to have accessibility uh, depending uh, on the size of the vessel. Uh, dredging is executed, uh, capital dredging. Uh, however, uh, to, in order to guarantee the accessibility, port is also conducting so called maintenance dredging. And uh, there are a uh, different type of uh, dredging strategies and dredging methods. The most common, uh, as you can see here, is a trailing suction hopper dredger. So this, uh, uh, this ship is collecting uh, sediment from the bottom. I like this analogy when, when the people say, so it works like a vacuum cleaner indeed. This uh, dredging vessel could uh, collect sediment as a vacuum cleaner and uh, reallocate the sediment to, to the open sea. Uh, there are also uh, the doors on the bottom of this vessel, and uh, sediment is relocated in the sea in such a way 
that the sediment loop goes to prepared allocated area. Uh, there are also other methods, for, for instance, pet leveler uh, and uh, plow board. Uh, these methods are used to make sure that uh, the bottom is, uh, is flat. So after dredging operations uh, or after some time when siltation is quite heavy in uh, the port area, uh, we see uh, red areas on, uh, on the maps, on the, on the dredging maps. And uh, basically, these areas could be leveled with, with this type of equipment to make sure that the bottom is flat, flat and it's enough depth for incoming vessels. Uh, there are also other methods like a grab dredger. Grab dredger also is used uh, well relatively often uh, because, because of its simplicity. So there are normally very small boards uh, comparing to, to the hopper dredgers. Uh, and uh, it's, these boats are easily used to access the places in the harbor uh, that are not accessible with the hopper dredger. And finally, also debris removal, also very often uh, that happens that uh, there are debris on the bottom and they could be seen also on the multi beam echo sounding uh, on the maps. And these debris are removed with this machine. Uh, and uh, if, it, if we talk about Port of Rotterdam, this is the diagram. And uh, as we see that about 80% of all the operations uh, done by trailing suction over dredger. So all this sediment is uh, uh, collected and reallocated to the open sea. If it's clean sediment and if it's contaminated sediment, then uh, it goes to to certain facility uh, for contaminated sediment. Uh, also in other, in other ports, for example, in Port of Hamburg, this contaminated material uh, goes through the treatment. Uh, so there are treatment plants. Uh, and uh, well, after the treatment, the sediment could be used for, for different uh, well, beneficial purposes. Uh, Port of Hamburg is also making bricks out of the sediment. Uh, also, you know, they're using the sediment for land reclamation and so on. So that. Uh, it really depends on the purpose of, uh, yeah, of the sediment treatment and the costs, of course. But before, uh, before uh, every maintenance dredging, uh, multi-beam echo sounding is typically conducted uh, in the port of Rotterdam. It's done on, on monthly basis uh, in port of Hamburg, uh, depending on, uh, yeah, on the type of the year. This, uh, this multi-beam echo sounding is conducted. Uh, and the collected data is used to map uh, the bottom uh, of, uh, of the port and uh, decide if uh, sediment actions should be conducted in order to guarantee the accessibility uh, of the certain port channel. Uh, this decision is made by a so-called uh, dredging desk. Uh, uh, well, in this dredging desk also, according, well, thanks to digital technologies, there are a lot of tools that could uh, help facilitate decision-making. There are digital maps, live uh, digital maps that are updated uh, continuously with a uh, new bisymmetry data. Uh, and uh, well, for instance, on the top right, you see one of these maps and uh, red dots uh, suggest that uh, these areas with red dots well, should, should be dredged if necessary. Uh, also, dredging desk is used for uh, also used for live monitoring of dredging operations. It's also quite convenient. Uh, so, dredging dredging vessels are sending uh, the information uh, related to dredging, so the positioning, for instance, of uh, of hopper dredger, uh, the, the position of uh, the suction head. Uh, so therefore, this dredging desk is also a hub for, uh, for available data for, for different type of maintenance. Uh, 
if you see also Port of Rotterdam, uh, it's divided on several sections. Uh, you could see it on the bottom, the bottom uh, picture. Uh, and uh, this section uh, basically uh, used in communication also for these contractors, staging companies. Uh, and uh, basically, if dredging operations are needed, then dredging desk is uh, contacting uh, dredging companies and they communicate which area should be actually maintained. Uh, after sediment is dredged, uh, sediment is reallocated to uh, to reallocation zone. So you see this uh, deep, quite deep and big uh, areas are prepared for the sediment uh, in the in the sea. So just for comparison, uh, this you see the size of the football field, and it's uh, yeah, it's the ten times smaller than than this uh, reallocation area. And it's only one compartment. Uh, in total, well, there could be about six compartments like that prepared in the sea for yeah for the sediment that is dredged in the in the port. And contaminated sediment, as I mentioned already, it goes to confined uh, environment either for permanent storage or for treatment, depending on the maintenance strategy of the port authorities. Uh, however, there is a different type of sediment. Uh, also, port authorities noticed that uh, uh, they could have a very uh, fluidized sediment in, in the airport. Uh, this, uh, this, this sediment is referred very, very often as fluid mud. Uh, density of, of this fluid mud is, is very low compared to, to uh, let's say, regular. Uh, bed, sandy bed, uh, density could be about uh, uh, 1100 kilogram per, per meter cubic. Uh, and uh, if port authorities are conducting bathymetry survey, and they really see this at the top of this fluid mud, so this interface between water and, uh, and sediment. Uh, and uh, port authorities also will notice that perhaps. It's not the best material to dredge, because uh, especially using uh, these uh, hopper dredgers, uh, because dredgers will fill up their volume quite quite fast with this uh, less dense material, and that was one of the motivations why port authorities also initiated different type of research. I will also provide more information in my next presentation. And here I will just state uh, well, progress so far and the state of the art. So if you look closely, uh, this is the core sample that is collected from the bottom. Uh, these layers, these mud layers are very obvious. Uh, so there are three main sediment type. Uh, there is fluid mud that is a very diluted material. Uh, on the other hand, there is consolidated sediment is uh, way less water, and you could see that it's already more like stiff material, and there is a layer somewhere in between. And uh, if you talk about densities, uh, fluid mud well, it's typically less than 1.2 kilogram per liter. Uh, this pre-consolidated sediment between 1.2 and 1.3, and uh, really consolidated sediment that uh, already well stiffer than fluid mud uh, density goes more than one one point three, and sometimes it's even better to compare this type of material to well, to, to to I don't know dessert to food. Uh, so if you think about fluid mud, it could be very well well linked to choco milk, choco milk, to choco. Uh, Pre-consolidated is, is more like yogurt, and uh, consolidated is like pudding. So this is just to give you an impression how these mud layers could be easily translated to, yeah, to other type of material. This knowledge uh, also triggered a new discussion with the ports. Uh, they were wondering if 
says fluid mud could be navigable uh, because of very, very small densities. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the you know, port authorities conduct lots of research on that because uh, indeed it was proven that fluid mud is navigable and uh, this fluid mud could be used for under clearance. However, uh, they had a lot of discussions where to indicate this level, the safety level, uh, that uh, basically could be used for implementation of this approach. And in the past, there are, well, there are several trials conducted for, you know, for, for addressing this type of questions, uh, like uh, is it safe to navigate through fluid mud and what, uh, what is the nautical criteria? And also how to measure this, this fluid map properties. Because uh, well, echo sounders, sonars, uh, the, this equipment space basically uh, could, uh, could indicate uh, the top layer of sediment, but how to measure properties inside the sediment. Uh, so for addressing these questions, three, or well, at least three pilots, were conducted in uh, Rotterdam, uh, in Zeebrugge and Belgium and Delzile. So I will also uh, provide some information about these pilots. The first, the first one was in, in the port of uh, Rotterdam in the 70s, uh, then a big oil tanker uh, SS Lepton uh, was uh, actually used uh, to, well, to monitor the ship uh, behavior during maneuverability near the entrance of the port. Uh, also, uh, for, the, well, for the first time, uh, density measurements were conducted in the water column. So mm -hmm. you could see also the, the right picture. Uh, there are several density profiles uh, that, uh, that were collected. Uh, and uh, this research, well, in combination, of course, with, uh, with laboratory studies and uh, more in-depth uh, in estimations uh, for, for navigation, for existence, and so on. Uh, this research uh, led to, uh, to criteria of 1.2 density for navigation that is used up to now in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, this this so-called nautical bottom uh, is a level 1.2 density. Uh, then experiments in uh, Zeebrugge in Belgium, they even they brought even more knowledge. Uh, at least uh, two pilot experiments were conducted. Uh, one with a uh, one with a dredger, with a hopper dredger. And uh, what was interesting that uh, for the first time negative underkill clearance was used during this pilot. So the ship uh, literally went uh, through fluid mud, is touching fluid mud. Uh, and it was reported that at some point uh, the pilots they they actually they they lost control, <laughs> they lost control of the vessel, and it was a little bit of panic. But the draft was reduced because it was a hopper dredger, so it was easy you could easy well uh, decrease the draft by releasing the water from the compartment. Uh, and uh, this experiment triggered additional research. Uh, and it was proven that uh, the ship also lost uh, well, uh, its own uh, controllability well, because of so-called internal waves, as you see on this picture. So it's a hydraulic jump uh, that uh, could uh, influence well, the ship itself. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, Belgium uh, research institutions and universities conducted more, more uh, uh, experimental work to, to see how this uh, internal waves are generated. And here is the result. I hope you could see this internal waves here under the ship. Uh, the, those results were executed in the Tobin tanks uh, with a viscous fluid. It wasn't fluid mud, but it was material, also some sort of non-Newtonian material as a substitution for fluid mud. Uh, and the, based on these results, also, Professor Fantore uh, also indicated uh, critical velocity 
So as you could see on this diagram, there is a critical velocity that uh, influences the position of this hydraulic jump and uh, as a function of the depth. Yeah, so and that was also quite a, quite a big uh, breakthrough for navigation through map because it's nice that uh, these estimates could be could be made uh, also in, in our days. Uh, based on these experiments uh, that were nicely summarized in Pyang's report, uh, the definition for nautical bottom was born, and uh, it's the following. The nautical bottom is the level where physical characteristics of the bottom reach a critical limit beyond which contact with the ship kill uh, causes either damage or unacceptable effects on controllability and maneuverability. Uh, and uh, talking about physical characteristics, uh, historically, density was used as a physical characteristic. Uh, and talking about critical limits, well, Port of Rotterdam also defined uh, uh, 1200 kilogram per meter cubic as a, as a critical limit. And other ports they supported and followed uh, this characteristic and limit. Uh, however, that was an exception was the port of Amden, uh, who decided to switch to rheology. Uh, why is that so? Because in port of Amden, uh, well, also their researchers conducted quite an extensive uh, investigation, uh, and they decided that the uh, yield stress, I will explain what is yield stress later in my second presentation, but uh, this value this value is used for, yeah, for navigation. Uh, and very recently, Hamburg uh, implemented uh, both physical characteristics, uh, yield stress and density for the nautical criteria. Uh, if we analyze uh, both characteristics, we could see that uh, the relationship between yield stress and density is nonlinear. For different ports, uh, there is a different relation between uh, uh, between density and yield stress, and that also triggers a lot of research and also fundamental research because port authorities want to know uh, why uh, why they have these properties in their harbor and what is the best method to maintain their harbor. And finally, how to measure this property? Because there are different types of equipment that could be used for measuring this yield stress and density. Normally, this equipment provides vertical profiles, either it's uh, density or this yield stress or shear strength. Uh, and uh, th there is different physics behind all this equipment could be used uh, as an acceleration or deceleration in water. And uh, this knowledge could be linked to, to shear strengths or uh, this, this equipment Rio Tune that is currently used in the port of Rotterdam and, uh, and uh, also in the port of Hamburg. Uh, the principle are based on the tuning fork. However, this equipment should be calibrated very well before deployment. Uh, so an extensive uh, data set should be available and uh, then Rio Tune measurements are reliable. Uh, also Dense, Dense X, uh, it's more X-ray based equipment. Uh, Rex Waterstad, so it's a Ministry of Transport uh, in the Netherlands. They are using this equipment for measuring densities. Uh, well, the main drawback is that uh, the personnel should be trained very well for using this equipment because of radiation. Uh, and also, there are other methods. Uh, the most conventional is just sampling, so there's a stool from load and sleep sampler that could be used to collect the sediment from the bottom. And then the sediment could be analyzed in the laboratory for, for different type of properties. But the main idea is that uh, these profiles could be also uh, linked somehow to seismic and acoustic measurements. And uh, this is possible nowadays. Also, uh, Hamburg Port Authority and Port of Rotterdam, uh, they are using uh, also uh, seismic based equipment, uh, some sort of uh, sub-bottom profiler. 
Uh, and from this sub bottom profiler, uh, different fluid map layers could be defined. So perhaps you see different contrast of green color on this picture and dark color uh, represent actually quite a consolidated mud. And this uh, white, uh, white layer on the top, uh, that is fluid mud. So if you collect a sample, you could really see that it's liquid. Uh, this material can flow. Uh, and uh, these measurements are also combined with multi beam data that, that, I, that give a simple water mud interface. So, this strategy for combining these three equipments uh, one is the bottom profiler, one is multi beam, and uh, is a real to more than sticks. Uh, this strategy is used in the pores to, to collect the data about density or rheology in the airport. And then correspondingly, they, they can define the nautical bottom and uh, use this fluid map that could be quite substantial layers up to one or two meters. So here, for example, this picture in Hamburg, this is about uh, three meters fluid map. And uh, this map is used for underkill clearance, which is actually saving lots of costs also for, for port authorities. And I believe that was my last slide for, for this part of the lecture, uh, just to recap uh, that uh, we learned about the uh, main factors that uh, influence port accessibility. And uh, I provided the state of the art. And in the next round, I will dive more in depth for, yeah, for research activities and for current projects that are executed in Europe. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, welcome everyone to the second round uh, of the course. Uh, during this round, I will present uh, ongoing uh, research activities. Uh, first of all, I will introduce uh, Madnet and uh, Prisma to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I will uh, elaborate more also on the fundamental knowledge that we developed uh, over the last years that I also mentioned also the, during the first part of, this, uh, of my lecture. And after that, uh, we will go more in depth uh, into new uh, methods that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we tested together with other port authorities for port accessibility, uh, mainly water injection dredging, navigations for mud, and uh, beneficial reallocation of sediment. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to, to introduce Magnet to you. Magnet is an academic platform uh, with uh, uh, several uh, assistant and associate professors at UDEL. And uh, what I will present to you, it's, it's also it's their involvement. So I would like to acknowledge them. Uh, they are different uh, experts in different fields, as you could see, uh, in dredging engineering, environmental fluid mechanics, geoengineering, uh, geophysics. So this group is a nice synergy uh, for yeah, multidisciplinary research. And within MADNET, uh, we have several uh, PhD projects, postdoc projects uh, that are mainly uh, sponsored by our partners. Uh, so Port Authorities, Port of Rotterdam, uh, also uh, M ports, uh, Hamburg Port Authority, uh, and uh, of course, uh, other research institutions that we have very close link with, uh, for example, Marin, and the parts. Uh, so what is MADNET? Uh, MADNET was uh, initiated uh, because of memorandum of understanding that was uh, written between Port Authorities and Hill Delft in, uh, in uh, 2017, if I'm correct. Uh, and uh, that will trigger a research collaboration between Port Authorities and uh, Hill Delft, uh, mainly on fundamental knowledge uh, that uh, can be used uh, also for applied research. Uh, so particularly, uh, we study uh, different type of sediment dynamics that I also, uh, also showed in my previous presentation. Uh, we study settling, calculation, the rheology of mud, erosion, consolidation, and so on. But also there are several projects uh, that are uh, that are developed for 
uh, studying um, novel methods for, for surveying, for example, how we can detect mud properties without a surveying vessel, without a ship. Uh, so this answer I will also provide to you uh, also later. Uh, and uh, well, these bullets that you see on the screen, these balls, so they all represent a research, separate research line. And for now, we have about 10 PhD students, postdocs who are working on developing this uh, new fundamental knowledge for the port authorities and uh, linking fundamental knowledge to practices. Uh, I would like to show a couple of examples of this project. Uh, this project, uh, Real Mud, uh, was, was also triggered by Hamburg Port Authority, uh, who wanted to have more knowledge on rheology. Because as I showed in my previous presentation, density is mainly used for, uh, as a criteria for nautical bottom. Uh, and I think uh, this density is uh, straightforward because we know we all know what density is, but with rheology it's it's more complicated, uh, and uh, and basically well this is one of the main goals of this project is to develop uh, and summarize available knowledge on rheology. When we talk about rheology, um, well, well we mainly talk about viscosity and yield stress. Uh, viscosity, I think, uh, well, you also, uh, well, you could compare water with, let's say, gel or honey, and uh, you see that its material is, uh, well, more viscous than water, right? Honey, well, it doesn't flow far, as it's shown on this picture. So viscosity is a measure of how far this liquid can flow. And heat stress is the measure of stress at which this liquid start to flow, start to yield. So if you take like a, like a tea paste, for example, and if you squeeze it, then, then the tea paste starts to flow out just because you've applied stress. And uh, that is called yield stress, basically, uh, of, yeah, of the tea space. And this yield stress is used for navigation in uh, several harbors. You could also think of the strengths of material, shear strengths, and shear strengths has a very, very good connection with uh, yield stress, with this geological property. Uh, this image I showed you before, uh, it represents uh, the link between the yield stress and the density and uh, this link, uh, the relation between yield stress and density differs for, from port to port. So for instance, uh, you see port of Emden uh, at very low densities who would expect already quite high yield stress. Uh, and with the port of Emden, you would like to understand why, why it is the case, what influences this behavior. Because that means that uh, this fluid mud would stay in suspension for a very long time. Uh, I will come back to Port of Emden because they use very specific uh, maintenance concept. It's also one of the most effective port maintenance concepts uh, because Port of Emden minimized the dredged volumes significantly over the last years. Uh, and uh, well, that's partly because they have a very specific mud. On the other hand, uh, we see that the uh, port of Antwerp is quite high, quite, quite high uh, density. Well, they have very low yield stress. So it's totally opposite to the behavior from uh, port of Emden. And also the question is uh, why, why this but that means that their mud is quite heavy and it settles also very fast. Therefore, new maintenance, well, maintenance should be more frequent, let's say. So over these years, uh, we studied within this project the link between rheological properties and uh, other parameters. And uh, we could prove that the rheological properties depend on natural processes, uh, like 
consolidation and hydrodynamics, so also different uh, currents could influence rheological properties, especially in the tidal zone. Uh, this is a perfect location for fluid mud formation uh, because uh, the tidal force is simply, uh, simply bigger than, uh, than gravitational forces and uh, fluid mud stays in suspension for a long time. Uh, rheological properties also depend on sediment properties, heavily depends on organic matter. Uh, this discovery uh, also triggered another research project that will come later. Uh, and also clay content and uh, clay mineralogy. So different particles of clay, uh, well, to, to differ, uh, react on, on, on rheological properties and contribute. Uh, totally different. Uh, and finally, rheological properties uh, react on external factors, for instance, navigation, uh, frequency of navigation, and of course, maintenance, depending on uh, different port maintenance techniques, these rheological properties could be either weaker or harder. Uh, this project is almost over, by the way, and uh, there is a list of papers that is available. Uh, so we summarized uh, all our new findings and uh, also literature search, different protocols, because there are lots of questions, a big discussion, for example, how to measure the serological properties, what is the best protocol, what is the best geometry. So that's all this knowledge uh, developed or redeveloped. And uh, there is a quite substantial list of uh, scientific uh, peer review publications available for that. Then I also mentioned uh, uh, another project, which is uh, we call Biomat, and it's related to Port of Emden that we see on the top uh, figure. Uh, Port of Emden uh, is also employing the concept of saving through mud. And uh, they were the pioneers of introducing biological property for selling so much, which is yield stress. Uh, and this uh, concept of selling so much is uh, very well linked to the maintenance concept. So what they do, uh, they, uh, they employ maintenance concept that is called red circulation. Uh, when, uh, when it's not enough, when the port is not accessible for inbound ships, then a hopper dredger uh, is called for collecting the sediment. So, so far, uh, this concept, I think, is also very well linked to any other harbor in the world. However, what they do, uh, they release, uh, after collecting the sediment, they release the sediment back in the port area, uh, creating fluid mud layer. So by doing this, they recirculate the sediment, they're reducing the sediment strengths and uh, create navigable wood mud layer that can be used for navigation. Because this, the properties, the logical properties of this wood mud uh, are very uh, low, uh, way lower than the logical criteria. And also, as I mentioned before, this mud it doesn't settle for a long time which is also quite beneficial for port authorities. Uh, that is why the, the frequency of this dredging, this recirculation is also, uh, let's say, lower than it could be in other ports. Uh, there is also scientific literature uh, given uh, on the conditioning, on this uh, recirculation or conditioning. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of scientists also attribute uh, this low settling properties to certain organic matter that uh, keep, keep uh, particles in suspension for a long time. That is called uh, slime. Uh, and uh, there are several microbiological studies now uh, also initiated by Port of Emden that would like to know more details about the slime and see how this condition in or the circulation could be even further improved. Another aspect uh, of biomat 
uh, is also looking for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yesterday, Mark uh, also outlined very nicely uh, the findings in other group that we also will look at emissions from uh, the shipping, from dredging, and it's very important for port authorities, especially in Europe. Uh, now, when uh, port authorities would like to be carbon neutral uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, as you see on this diagram, that there are lots of emissions currently, uh, of, for instance, in port of, port of Rotterdam, based on this figure from 2017, about 40%, about 40% of total dredging come from, uh, CO2 so, so emissions come from dredging. And what we do in, uh, in this project Biomart, uh, we also quantify the CO2 emissions uh, from mud itself, uh, because uh, because greenhouse gases are emitted uh, due to organic matter degradation, uh, and that contributes to the total carb carbon footprint in the in the port. And, uh, this uh, CO2 footprint could be also compared. Uh, for example, here uh, you see emissions of CO2 uh, that come from from the fuel that is used uh, for, for dredging. So it's basically from dredging machines, it's given in red, and uh, CO2 emissions uh, from organic matter degradation. And as you could see, this organic matter degradation CO2 emissions is quite substantial. Uh, if you talk about uh, this type of emissions, it's factor 10 comparing to uh, CO2 emissions from dredging machine. Uh, in this case, it was so, also a hopper type of maintenance. Uh, also, if we uh, look at organic matter in uh, fresh water harbors, uh, we see that it's actually also quite a big problem uh, for these harbors, uh, not only from a CO2 and greenhouse gas perspectives, uh, but also this uh, organic uh, matter produces uh, a lot of bubbles, and these bubbles is really a problem for surveying. Uh, any acoustical methods or sonars or multi-beam uh, are given, uh, cannot provide a reliable criteria, reliable uh, water depths because of this uh, gas production on the bottom. So on this photo, for instance, uh, you might think that this is uh, rain, but it's not rain. This dust bubbles, they come from the bottom and they look just a, like rain, but uh, it's really a big problem for, for this board. Um, uh, also, well, we study in depth also this organic matter degradation, and we know that uh, this degradation decreases with depth, with age. So there is a lot of gas production on the top layers typically, uh, and uh, in the bottom material, uh, it's, well, it's way less, uh, that doesn't have a lot of degradable organic matter. Um, and uh, well, they also learn the fluid mud, uh, it's active material in, in a very long term. So these experiments could take up to three years to, to draw, let's say, first conclusions of, on organic matter degradability. Next, uh, we have also quite extensive program on navigation through mud, uh, also Port of Rotterdam, uh, Port of Hamburg uh, have their own research programs uh, that are related uh, to navigation through mud and uh, uh, well, they are aimed to develop new knowledge on mud. We conduct uh, experiments for navigation through mud. Uh, uh, so here it's, a, it's actually Experiments are conducted in the, one of the flumes in Deltares. Uh, and the goal of these experiments is to uh, collect a data set for this object. As you see, it's not a real vessel, but it's a representative uh, object. Uh, and uh, the object measures the resistance that is necessary for calibrating the CD models. On the top right, this is an example of the CED model that is developed with uh, uh, Marin, this research institution that specialized on uh, navigation. 
Uh, and uh, for now, Marin has uh, also this uh, CFD code uh, in there, and they are basically navigational model. Uh, th that brings additional uh, opportunities for testing uh, various uh, navigational and maneuvering, maneuvering situations for the vessel. Uh, next, uh, we also uh, using different uh, surveying techniques, also as I mentioned in the beginning, how we can use, uh, well, how we can map bisymmetry without a surveying vessel. So this idea also came, uh, well, also from one of our brilliant master students who, uh, who is working in the port of Rotterdam now. So he proposed to use a so-called fiber optical cable, the cable that is used for uh, communication. <clears throat> he proposed to install this fiber optical cable, uh, well, in a different way, but uh, preliminary we thought we can install it on the bottom <clears throat> uh, and uh, use uh, typical sonar, uh, any sonar that is mounted on the vessel for, as a source of the signal. And we conducted several trials. You see laboratory flume again, so this yellow uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom uh, right, you see this yellow cable, and yellow color. Uh, it can be used as a receiver to receive uh, different acoustic or seismic signal. Uh, however, this time we also realized that we can use uh, propellers noise as a source. Uh, and uh, that also uh, opened a new direction also for us. So we don't actually need a sonar, we don't need a surveying vessel. We can use propeller as a source of the, of, uh, of the signal and we can monitor this noise from the propeller uh, on, the, on this fiber optical cable that can be transferred in a, in a water mat interface. And uh, we look further how to how we can really transform this uh, signal into a logical bottom type of criteria at this moment, meaning uh, is a density or, or shear strength or, or yield stress and so on. Uh, next uh, next project uh, we develop also models uh, that could be used for planning, port maintenance. And also these models are quite fundamental. Uh, uh, well, they could be applied to the data, the data that was shown previously from, this, uh, uh, from the tools that measure density and uh, also is a yield stress or shear strength. Uh, this data uh, was collected uh, during the pilots. So we have lots of data now uh, and we try to uh, develop new tool that could uh, predict uh, when is the right moment for maintenance. Uh, and this tool is based on the fundamental knowledge, as I mentioned. Uh, so there are several uh, fundamental processes are integrated uh, in, uh, in, in this tool, uh, like uh, settling, consolidation, uh, and uh, well, moving the parameters of the segment and uh, calibrating this model to the measured data. Uh, we can potentially say, and the next maintenance is needed. Is it uh, in uh, two months, three months, uh, when the mud becomes not navigable and uh, go bottom? But that's what I wanted to share with you from the perspective of uh, fundamental research and MADNET. Uh, this knowledge can be transferred uh, to, to the project PRISMA that was initiated by the Port of Rotterdam. And when my, one of the main goals was uh, and still is to reduce CO2 emissions and uh, develop a new maintenance. Um, I have a video, so I think, I hope it works well. Uh, this video will, will show uh, the objectives and the scope of this project. Uh, I'm, I apologize because the, the video is in Dutch, but there are English subtitles, so I hope, uh, well, you could see the video and, uh, yeah, and follow the subtitles. Let's see. Yeah.
De haven van Rotterdam is continu op zoek naar oplossingen om de haven slimmer, efficiënter, beter en duurzamer te maken. Hiervoor kijken we zelfs ook onder het wateroppervlak, waar een op het eerste gezicht onwaarschijnlijke bron van innovatie ligt. Slip. In vloeibare vorm biedt dit vele kansen. Een van de voorwaarden voor een goede en bereikbare haven is de waterdiepte. Voor elke vaarweg geldt een minimale afstand tussen het diepste punt van het schip en de bodem, internationaal aangegeven als UKC, Under Keel Clearance. In veel zeehavens, zoals in Rotterdam, bestaat de bovenste laag van de bodem uit slip. Om de waterdiepte op peil te houden, baggeren we waar nodig. Het slip wordt opgezogen en getransporteerd naar open zee. In Rotterdam denken we dat we dit efficiënter en duurzamer kunnen doen. Om de CO2-uitstoot te verlagen en kosten te besparen, kijkt het onderzoeksprogramma van het havenbedrijf Prisma naar innovatieve baggermethodes en naar hoe slip zich gedraagt. De oplossing is simpel en doeltreffend. Maak slip vloeibaar. Vloeibaar slip heeft nagenoeg dezelfde dichtheid als water. Hierdoor kunnen schepen er moeiteloos en veilig doorheen varen. De internationale definitie van de waterbodem en daarmee de diepte van de haven moeten we daarvoor wel opnieuw bepalen. Het slip kan in vloeibare fase ook makkelijk worden geleid, kunstmatig of door gebruik te maken van de bestaande stromingen. Een proef met Water Injection Dredger WID, in het Kallandkanaal is onderdeel van het onderzoek. In deze proef injecteren we slip met water. Daardoor wordt het vloeibaar. Het vloeibare slip leiden we vervolgens naar het midden van een havenbekken. Hier kan het slip neerslaan en consolideren, of we houden het vloeibaar met WID. Als het slip consolideert kan het eenvoudig opgezogen worden door de sleephopperzuiger. Daardoor zijn in totaal minder vaarbewegingen nodig. Dit bespaart kosten en vermindert de uitstoot van CO2. Het Prisma onderzoek wordt onder andere uitgevoerd door TU Delft, Deltares en Marin. Deltares richt zich op de karakteristieken van vloeibaar slip. Marin onderzoekt de effecten op de scheepsbewegingen met het oog op een veilige navigatie. Vloeibaar slip biedt volop kansen. We zetten ons daarom met onze partners in om de nieuwe baggertechniek verder te ontwikkelen, toe te passen en een internationale maatstaf ervoor te creëren. We werken daarvoor samen met onder andere grote zeehavens zoals die van Hamburg en gerenommeerde instituten. Allemaal met hetzelfde doel. Een veilige, efficiënte en duurzame haven waar onze klanten succesvol kunnen ondernemen. En uh, wat was de main motivation voor uh, well, deze research? When mainly, if you see, uh, for instance, well, the costs of maintenance uh, and dredged volumes from the port of Rotterdam and port of Hamburg. You see that over the last 10 years, this cost increased uh, well, a lot, uh, sometimes even doubled. And, uh, uh, well, port authorities are looking for additional knowledge and uh, see how these dredged volumes could be minimized. Uh, and currently, uh, different strategies uh, are considered for minimizing the depressed volumes. Uh, one of them is uh, revising the, the interventional uh, protocols, uh, implementing navigation above fluid mark or through fluid mark in other locations of the port. Another one, another strategy is to change the reallocation site. Uh, I will show you later. Uh, how this uh, sediment reallocation could be used for beneficial purposes in the port area. And uh, finally, uh, optimizing a current maintenance. Uh, for example, water injection dredging. Uh, so also I started this work on, on developing new knowledge on water injection dredging when I, when I was employed as a postdoc and I'm still uh, conducting experiments and uh, developing knowledge on this matter. But uh, in general, if, uh, if we analyze port maintenance, 
uh, I think we can choose two uh, separate strategies. Uh, one is uh, keep sediment in water, and another strategy is bring sediment on land. Uh, by keep uh, sediment in water, uh, that means that traditionally uh, sediment uh, can be reallocated to the open sea or perhaps to other areas, uh, again, for beneficial reuse. Uh, and also we can consider conditioning of, uh, of sediment. Uh, this maintenance technique in the port of Amden can be also used, uh, could be also called conditioning uh, because uh, uh, the sediment is recirculated. Uh, first it's collected from the bottom, but then, then it uh, pumped back to create this fluid part. So in this way, uh, the part, the sediment is conditioned. And for bringing sediment on land, uh, uh, also very often that is done for contaminated sediment. Uh, it's either permanently stored in uh, special uh, facilities or uh, it goes through mechanical treatment uh, where the sediment uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, cleaned from, uh, from con contaminants uh, and uh, later can be used for uh, making bricks or dike reinforcement or land reclamation. So basically for beneficial type of uh, yeah, usage for the, of the setting. Uh, but for this presentation, we are mainly focused on, uh, uh, on, the, on the first part, which will be uh, keep sediment in water. Uh, and uh, I will also provide you with the update on our knowledge that we develop also for, uh, for water injection dredging. Because, uh, because water injection dredging could be used actually for both uh, uh, parts of keeping sediment in water, as I mentioned. Uh, so here you can see two examples. The example number one, uh, water injection dredging is conducted close to, to the mouth or, or in the estuary, uh, and uh, it is conducted in the app tight. Uh, sediment is fluidized, it's more diluted during water injection dredging, and then as a density current, uh, it uh, leaves the harbor to harbor area to the to the open sea. Uh, moreover, it, it's, it's it's good to conduct these experiments during the during the ebb, conduct this maintenance during the ebb tide, uh, because the currents uh, speed up uh, the velocity of this fluidized sediment. Uh, also, uh, the, the water injection dredging could be used for conditioning. Here, the second option mentioned as uh, conditioning. And normally, uh, this option can be done in uh, either flood dominated areas or uh, the areas uh, or the areas with uh, limited uh, uh, hydrodynamic conditions. So in quiet area, low energy area, uh, then what uh, this, this water injection region vessel could uh, help to, uh, to create uh, fluid mud layers that are navigable uh, with the uh, utilization of the nautical bottom criteria. Uh, we conducted several pilots over these uh, last years and uh, several research questions uh, actually uh, well, the drawing in the beginning of the experiments. And there are several areas that were used for water injection dredging pilots, uh, but I will show you the results from the Kalan Canal. It's uh, very close to, yeah, to the estuary. Uh, and uh, we conducted these experiments in order to, to answer the following questions. Uh, what factors should be taken into account during water injection dredging? And uh, by factors, I mean like local factors in the area where the day is conducted. Uh, what are environmental impact of water injection dredging? How uh, these dredging operations influence uh, also the turbidity in the water column? Uh, what are CO2 and cost benefits 
for water injection region and for applying water injection region for port maintenance. Uh, I, well, we did a comparison between uh, cost benefits and CO2 benefits uh, for water injection region and for regular copper region. Uh, another question, when should water injection region be conducted? What is the frequency of the, this uh, regular port, port maintenance? And finally, what is the navigation or criteria in, during or after water injection region? Uh, because uh, again, this water injection region can create a certain uh, fluid mud layer. And then the question is, what, uh, what shall we do for navigation? Uh, what criteria could be used for navigation in this fluid mud layer? During the pilot, we used uh, quite a substantial uh, number of different tools. Uh, we used acoustical and seismic tools to map uh, the difference between water, fluid, mud, and uh, like a, like a uh, bottom of uh, of the channel uh, during and uh, before and after water injection dredging operations. We used also rear tune uh, to see what is the density and yield stress uh, in a water column. Uh, we also could uh, measure uh, the flow velocity of this uh, density current, this fluid mud, mobile fluid mud. Uh, we can also uh, monitor the velocity uh, in order to predict where this mud goes to and how far does it go. Uh, uh, also, we used uh, sediment uh, concentration profilers. Uh, we, we monitored suspended sediment concentration in the water column for environmental purposes. And finally, we conducted a lot of sampling experiments, collected samples, uh, brought them in laboratory and analyzed for, for any, any properties that we are interested in. Here, I would like to show you the sketch of one of the water injection region pilot. Uh, so we started during week uh, zero. Uh, so in the Kalan Canal, uh, you see uh, in blue, this is the deeper part, and uh, in uh, red, this is more shallower part. Uh, there is a sediment trap actually was, was made here for this pilot. So this blue color indicates the sediment trap. And then during day one, we started uh, conducting uh, water injection region. Uh, it was conducted uh, for quite uh, some time, for, for one week at least. Um, and uh, well, you see, for, for instance, on other figures, the bathymetry is changing. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, this is multi beam data, by the way. So that means that uh, we are creating quite a substantial uh, fluid mud layer. Uh, it's about uh, two meters. And uh, hydrodynamic conditions are. Uh, uh, quiet in this area, uh, and therefore this fluid mud it stays in the harbor, it doesn't leave the port. And from the same data set, we could see that uh, this way we can monitor quite efficiently settling of this fluid mud. Uh, so the level, the bathymetry level changes, uh, becomes, uh, well, more, well, water column becomes more uh, pronounced, uh, becomes bigger this time because mud simply settles and consolidates. Also, uh, we used uh, this CLAS that uh, can help us to map horizons uh, or levels, density levels in particular. Uh, uh, here on this image, we see again this contrast in, in green, so in dark green. Uh, you could see this is. Uh, uh, well, real bottom is consolidated mud and more lighter green on the top. That's a fluid mud layer that we create. And we could also quite uh, efficiently see uh, this is the horizon of, uh, of uh, 1.2 density. The development of this horizon this time, we can see that uh, mud start to consolidate. Uh, and, flu and fluid mud layer becomes consolidated. Uh, and at some point, we need to conduct water injection dredging again, having this knowledge and also coupling this knowledge of the measurements with, with our models that we developed. 
And coming back to, to the research questions that we defined and what we learned, uh, what factors should be taken into account during water injection dredging. Uh, first of all, it's hydrodynamic conditions as what in, in, in the bay area. Uh, we need to know direction, uh, current velocities, uh, either we have existing density currents or salinity gradients, because if you know this, uh, this data, uh, then we could uh, optimize better what injection dredging actions. And uh, luckily in the port of Rotterdam, there are a lot of uh, data on hydro and meteor uh, conditions. And we could run the prediction models and uh, see if we conduct water injection dredging in the right way. Uh, second, uh, what factors should be taken into account? It's sediment properties, a grain size distribution, shear strength, density, oxygen consumption, and sediment quality, of course, because if the sediment is contaminated, water injection dredging is simply not allowed uh, in that area. And the grain size distribution for sandy area, uh, water injection dredging could be uh, less efficient because, of course, uh, Sand, well, sand particles are way heavier than uh, particles of mud, and we cannot really create an efficient density current or fluid mud current out of, uh, of sandy bed. Um, uh, also, boundary conditions of the maintained area. So we need to know symmetry, slope angle. Uh, if you have a slope, that slope could be used also for water injection dredging and speed up. Uh, the density currents. Uh, and finally, uh, we need to know what the injection dredging operational parameters. That's basically the parameter that are defined by dredging company, uh, also for building up this dredging vessel. Uh, so diameter of nozzles, flow velocity, uh, the distance between jet and the, the sediment, trailing speed, and so on. Uh, this knowledge are typically available with dredging companies, but uh, they are not in open access. Uh, and uh, that's why we, well, we initiated this research. Uh, and here you see a couple of uh, experiments uh, that were conducted in Beltares lab also. So in the middle, yeah, you see also water injection dredging jet uh, that, is, uh, that was used for uh, fluidized part from the port of Rotterdam. And we put lots of sensors in this, in this uh, uh, flume in order to study these properties and to, to find the right operational parameters. So these properties will be also uh, published quite, quite soon. Uh, next question is what the environmental impact of water injection region We conducted uh, another monitoring campaign uh, to study suspended sediment uh, concentration in the water column before and after water injection dredging. And the good thing is that uh, if we use right operational parameters for water injection dredging, uh, we can create a density current that is uh, mainly generated uh, well next to the bottom. So sediment doesn't really go to, to the entire water column uh, and uh, that that proves that water injection dredging is actually quite, well, doesn't really have a big impact on environmental impact, uh, uh, imp environmental factors if you talk about uh, turbidity in the water column. Because we compared the measurements before, after, and during water injection dredging, and we see only sediment, uh, only this concentration of suspended sediment that is increased, uh, let's say, one, maximum two meters above the bed. That's it. So that's well, that's quite good actually outcome uh, of this study. Uh, also, uh, we made a comparison of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, and in general, uh, if we compare the engine uh, for a hopper dredger and for water injection dredging vessel. Uh, Hopper dredger, of course, it's a uh, it's much more complex mechanism than water injection dredging mechanism. Water injection dredging mechanism is mainly, well, it's mainly you could see the pump that, uh, that pumps the water out. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, and therefore, it emits uh, way less uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases during dredging process. 
So here you see the diagram uh, by comparing dredged volumes uh, before uh, one year before uh, the pilots that we conducted, two years before, uh, and uh, comparing to to the uh, to the year when the pilot was executed, and uh, we see that actually uh, by deploying uh, water injection dredging, uh, we could save about uh, 200,000 uh, meter, meter cubics only for this pilot, only for this area. And uh, uh, back moment. And for, uh, for CO2, CO2 reduction, uh, we can save about uh, 65% uh, of CO2. So 65% of CO2 less uh, for water injection dredging comparing to, to regular maintenance costs. Uh, the question, the next question is when uh, water injection dredging should be conducted. And we developed also a number of models, also with Tune Delft, also in Deltares, uh, for studying this uh, density currents to see how far this density current the goal from a water injection dredging area. Uh, this is also very important for port authorities because uh, they need to know uh, what happens to this uh, density current or uh, fluid mud that is induced by water injection dredging. Particularly, does it go to the open sea or it goes to another harbor area or it stays uh, at the injection point? So all these questions could be uh, potentially analyzed also with these tools that we developed uh, also together with Pentares. Uh, and what is the navigational criteria uh, after water injection dredging? Uh, well, as we discussed, this nautical bottom concept that could be also quite suitable for water injection dredging because uh, the mud that is the fluid mud layer that is induced by water injection dredging. Uh, it's having quite weak properties and it's navigable. So the yield stresses are very low and density is also relative, relatively low. Therefore, the smart could be used by adapting uh, the, yeah, the density criteria or yield stress criteria. So that's uh, still in discussion what would be the best for the port maintenance. Uh, in general, these pilots uh, resulted in the following knowledge. Um, well, first of all, uh, water injection dredging uh, is employed as a regular port maintenance concept in the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, and uh, for navigation, when we conduct this, when, when we have a limited accessibility after conducting this uh, water injection dredging, especially in uh, low energy regions, this uh, fluid mud could be used as a, uh, yeah, as a, as a under Q clearance for incoming vessel is a criteria of density. Density would be lower than uh, 1.2 kilogram per liter. Uh, and it's possible to monitor these properties of mud because we tested different types of material different types of uh, tools that uh, could measure density, yield stresses. Uh, again, we have quite substantial data set. Uh, and uh, well, if the tools are properly calibrated, they keep reliable data. And we can clearly see here on the picture, for example, one week after water injection dredging, we see about one meter of uh, navigable fluid mud that could be used also for navigation. Uh, and in three weeks, the fluid mud layer settles, so now it's half a meter. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, let's say in, uh, in uh, five, six weeks, uh, this, let, this layer is already consolidated, so it has to be dredged again. So those are results for this uh, specific pilot. And uh, this image, this image here shows the different criteria uh, for navigation. Uh, 
because we compared uh, criteria of multi beam that is uh, typically used for yeah for mapping by symmetry uh, with uh, 1.2 density level and 100 pascal uh, and uh, we see the development of these levels as a function of time after water injection dredging uh, for, for now uh, we see that the uh, rheological property is given the most promising criteria so it's, it's a blue line uh, uh, so it gives quite a substantial advantage for port accessibility, especially just after water injection dredging, so it's two meters. Uh, and uh, uh, as well as mud settles and consolidates, uh, this level is going upwards. Uh, uh, however, it stays on acceptable level because in this picture, the red line represents nautical guarantee depths. Uh, so this is uh, basically the level uh, acceptable for navigation. And uh, well, the fluid mud uh, with very low properties can be used for 100 cube clearance. And the most important that uh, in this area, uh, this area wasn't maintained for three months. So for three months, uh, uh, the fluid mud was used for under kill clearance and the uh, port didn't conduct uh, any maintenance. If you compare to other uh, periods uh, of the year, normally this area is maintained at least once a month. So that's actually quite a good example that water injection dredging could be could reduce the frequency of port maintenance. So now it's a general summary of lessons learned. Uh, and uh, how uh, this research could be used also in other maintenance concepts. Uh, first, this is uh, savings through mud. I think I already mentioned several times that uh, fluid mud uh, could be used for underkill clearance for, for incoming vessels. Uh, also, for sediment traps, it's quite old uh, technique to mitigate incoming sediment. However, it's still efficient especially if the sediment traps are located in the different uh, port areas uh, and in tidal zones, food uh, suspended sediment can be quite successfully collected by the sediment traps. And it can also uh, collect uh, the fluid mud layers that could be either induced by water injection dredging or, uh, for example, during the storm conditions. Uh, we also have quite substantial fluid mud layers. And, uh, well, these layers could be collected in the sediment trap near the entrance on the channel. Uh, another advantage uh, of the sediment trap uh, that conditions in, within the sediment trap are hydrodynamic conditions are more quiet, uh, and this fluid mud would uh, uh, settle and consolidate quite fast in sediment trap. And when it's consolidated, then of course it's more efficient to collect the sediment also by hopper pressure. It's way more efficient to collect in fluid mud because again, because of different densities, consolidated sediment uh, in general, uh, well, more appropriate to collect. Uh, and also all this sediment is, uh, well, is within the sediment trap. So the location for dredging the area is uh, also smaller and it's more convenient uh, option. It's more convenient than uh, hopper dredger is collecting the sediment uh, in the entire area. Uh, then also the dredging uh, quality is also not uh, very efficient when, uh, when hoppers are, uh, are executing dredging operations in, in a big area. Another option is, all, is conducting water injection dredging in pockets near the, near the purses. Uh, typically, it is problematic to, uh, well, to collect this sediment uh, efficiently uh, with hopper dredgers uh, because they, they, they are rather big and uh, they need a certain also turning angle for, for executing these operations. Uh, so for ships, uh, when there is not enough accessibility near the pockets. Water injection dredging can be conducted easily again. Uh, and uh, by liquefying uh, fluid mud 
this uh, sediment can be used again for navigation by deploying the nautical bottom concept. Uh, water injection dredging can be also conducted in the port basins, and it can be also quite successfully combined uh, with sediment traps. So sediment trap uh, by itself will collect uh, incoming sediment, depending if it comes from the sea or, or uh, from the river. And uh, at the same time, it can be also used for collecting uh, the mud, the fluid mud that, uh, that is fluidized by water injection engine vessels. And this time, again, when this mud settles and consolidates, it is more appropriate for, uh, for hopper traders to collect the sediment uh, and uh, reallocate to, to the open sea. And finally, uh, well, there is another uh, option that was also tested, uh, I think, in the Kroningen seaport. Uh, this is stationary water injection region when uh, the whole pipe system is installed on the bottom. Uh, and uh, again, when there is not enough space, there is not enough accessibility for uh, for incoming vessels, this pipe system uh, used for injecting water and fluidizing this mud layer. And uh, as soon as fluid mud layer is created, uh, there is enough space for incoming vessels because they can easily adapt uh, this nautical bottom criteria. And uh, we could look even further if there is a sediment trap next to the stationary this, uh, system. Uh, because of the slope angle, uh, fluid mud uh, can, can uh, flow by its own yeah, weight to, to the sediment trap and uh, collect it there. Uh, and also maintained later by the hopper dredgers uh, because uh, it's more convenient and there is enough space for hoppers to execute their operations. And finally, uh, one of the estimated outcomes for this navigation through fluid mud pilots, uh, because uh, also based on the pilots, based on the developed knowledge, uh, new areas also in the port uh, were uh, actually defined for nautical bottom criteria. So nautical bottom criteria was also used there. And it was estimated uh, the following impact of this fluid mud uh, areas, it's about, about 10, 20% advantage. Uh, savings and dredging costs, of course, because of, because of the frequency of dredging costs. Uh, better environmental footprint, because uh, for water injection dredging, again, as we tested, uh, the mud is typically, uh, uh, the fluidized mud is typically located next to the bottom, not in the, in the entire uh, water column. Uh, well, increased load. Because uh, then ship is bigger draft uh, could come to the harbor if uh, if there is enough and sufficient undercue clearance uh, and less hindrance uh, meaning uh, that the uh, hopper dredgers that uh, the ship uh, for example container ship shouldn't wait for dredgers to execute the operations uh, because it takes some time uh, for dredging operations with a hopper dredger. But with water injection dredging vessel, it's more efficient and the vessel itself uh, also much uh, smaller than the hopper dredger and the operations could go faster, which result in uh, less hindrance, uh, less traffic, let's say, uh, in the port area. Uh, finally, I would like to briefly uh, introduce you also the results of uh, pilot for a new beneficial reallocation of bridge material uh, that was also executed in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, typically, uh, reallocation area uh, is located uh, in, the, in the North Sea for, for the harbor. And uh, well, it's, it's quite expensive generally to bridge material uh, close, to the, to the, close to the city and uh, bring it to, to the sea because, uh, because of the quite large transport distances. Uh, and it was suggested 
of this area location area uh, could be in the river itself. Uh, and uh, we also conducted several pilots uh, to see if uh, we can use also big uh, river discharges uh, and uh, reallocate uh, the dredge material in the area that is indicated on the map. Uh, and uh, why is beneficial reallocation? Because uh, this sediment uh, is also used for, for nourishment in uh, one of the areas uh, next to the relocation site. It's called uh, Greenport. So there are new plans to, to construct also like a new habitat uh, in this area. And the sediment uh, uh, also can be used for, for the nourishment there. So that's why it's win-win combination. On the one side, the sediment is reallocated not uh, far away and then saving the costs. And, uh, on the other side, uh, the sediment could be used for nourishment. Uh, and when it's relocated in that area, then uh, natural currents could uh, bring the sediment naturally to, uh, to the sea. Uh, so during the pilot, uh, about uh, 580 uh, thousands of cubic meters uh, were relocated uh, in 2019, uh, which resulted also quite uh, significant savings, uh, which is about, about 2 million a year. And I think that, that's what I wanted to share with you today. That's, that's my last uh, pilot. Uh, I have just this slide. Uh, currently, we have two open PhD positions uh, in our team. Uh, we are developing uh, the port maintenance strategies uh, further. Uh, also looking for trade-offs, trade-offs that Mark also presented in previous lecture, uh, trade-offs between uh, port accessibility uh, and uh, also dredging and to dynamic processes. Uh, and we do, we do this PhD positions, we work on this PhD positions uh, very closely with our industrial partners. Uh, first position uh, is, uh, well, is done together with uh, FANORT and another position uh, with Port of Emden. So if you are interested uh, in these positions, just uh, simply just write an email to me. I think. Uh, you have my email address. Uh, if not, uh, ask Pablo. Um, I think that's it. Okay, Alex, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really insightful uh, and again, inspiring. Uh, I believe there are quite, quite some, some topics coming to, to all of us, uh, to our minds. So, well, we already share just uh, your your profile with all your contact details to, to everybody on, on the emails. Uh, so they can contact you, but as you mentioned, I'm always available for, for, for any other further question. Um, well, just uh, to keep moving ahead, I think uh, there are some, some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, I believe uh, there was one question from Carlos from Peru related on, on how you could recommend uh, to carry out dynamic auscultations on shallow seabed uh, in order to, to understand uh, what's the, the soil profile from 10 to 20 meters. Uh, well, uh, that was the, the, first, the first question, how you could start with this. How to execute what, sorry, Pablo? To, to profile uh, the seabed uh, mm -hmm. on, on shallow seabeds. Mm -hmm. So how, how, what will be your, your recommendations for starting? Uh, for shallow and uh, how shallow, that's also a question. How shallow? Uh, <laughs> Let me check around 10 to, well, the, the auscultation, it was not clarified. 
but I think it was, well, he wanted to, to understand in the 10 to 20 meters depth, but mm -hmm. uh, with quite some sedimentation. So I would say around five meters or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, there's really, I think, depends on the sediment condition in the area. Because, uh, well, as I also presented, uh, uh, if uh, really did, well, the monitoring strategies really depend uh, on the sediment type, it's sediment, uh, sandy sediment or muddy sediment. Uh, if there is a muddy sediment, uh, perhaps sub bottom profilers could uh, help to, to map this, uh, this uh, fluid mud layer. If you have fluid mud or more soft material, so it really depends. Uh, and uh, that will give you an indication of the layer thickness. Uh, and uh, if you are interested more, I don't know what is the main motivation, but if, if it's for navigation, you could also think of uh, implementing this nautical bottom approach, which, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is tested and implemented also in many countries, also worldwide. So there are some, some boundary conditions for implementing this nautical bottom approach and some data collection is needed, uh, but uh, uh, that's yeah. already quite a modern concept. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, I think also we have a question from Van San Besson. Uh, Van San, would you like to, to yes. open your mic and give the question to Alex directly? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wonder, uh, you, you told us about um, CO2 release because of sediment degradation. And I wonder if it's um, a natural process occurring, whether or not there is dredging, or if dredging activities increase impact this uh, CO2 release. And if, uh, depending on the kind of uh, dredging techniques, uh, CO2 release could be increased or decreased according to the, to the techniques and processes. Yeah, okay, thank you, Vincent. Uh, indeed, uh, CO2, well, organic matter degradation is a natural process. Uh, and uh, there, is a, there is a balance uh, in, uh, uh, in CO2 emissions depending on, uh, on dredging activities, but also the type of this organic matter. Uh, uh, for instance, it really depends uh, if there is an oxygen penetration or not into this uh, organic material, uh, because uh, because uh, you, you could think of, if, if you think about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we have methane and we have CO2, right? And methane is much more heavier. Uh, it's like factor 25 if you quantify the CO2 emissions. Um, so basically, uh, the oxygen uh, penetration result in more CO2 emissions than methane. So it could be beneficial. Uh, however, uh, if we talk about CO2 emissions and relation to dredging, uh, in general, uh, we made a comparison where we made, uh, where we considered a different uh, uh, type of dredging, like a hopper dredger or water injection dredging, with a baseline where we do nothing. And in general, when we do nothing, it's the most preferable condition. So that basically the answer for your question. Yes, region can potentially trigger more greenhouse gas emissions from organic matter degradation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting, I think, especially if you consider what you present us, uh, the factor between uh, greenhouse gas emission from mortal uh, machine dredge, etc., is like uh, eight uh, times less than uh, sediment degradation. So it's to put in consideration those two, uh, to those two aspects is, is interesting. And uh, I, it's the first time I, I heard from that. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So now uh, I think also the whole dredging industry is focusing on uh, minimizing CO2 emissions from dredging machines, also port authorities. Uh, but uh, well, I think some efforts should, I needed to also to minimize somehow uh, also CO2 emissions from organic matter degradation in the operations because of this uh, quite big factor of, yeah, eight, sometimes 10 
depends on the uh, bridging mechanisms. And uh, these results will also actually uh, confirmed also by other parties. So also with my colleagues, also in Deltares, actually, they also came to similar conclusions that uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from organic matter degradation are quite substantial. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vansan. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I think perhaps, Raul, do you have any, any comment or question you wanted to address as well? Uh, yes, Alex. Uh, how do you determine the dredge volume when you use a water injection dredging? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so for, for dredged volume, uh, we conduct a survey uh, before uh, water injection dredging and after water injection dredging. Uh, and then we could uh, uh, determine well, the difference between the bisymmetry. Uh, and uh, if you know the density that is also measured, then it will result in the volume of trash material. Okay, so you compare uh, pre and post uh, dredging surveys, and you have to know the density. Exactly. exactly. Okay. And uh, uh, what is the best way of contracting water injection dredging? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good question, Raul, because uh, uh, it was uh, one of the main problems for, uh, I think, for using water injection agent as a maintenance concept, because regular maintenance concept, uh, because uh, we need to have available water injection agent vessels. And uh, very often they are somewhere in another part of the world and they cannot come to. Rotterdam straight away and execute water injection dredging. Uh, however, uh, also dredging companies uh, built uh, very recently also new water injection dredging vessels. So these vessels are more available and uh, there is a, a bigger variation for water injection dredging vessels. And I know that also Port uh, is also working on the details of this con contracting details with the, yeah, this water injection dredging vessels. Because uh, I think they cannot use the same type of contracts that are typically standard for hopper bridge. So this work is in progress. How to optimize it? Now it's done on hourly base, basis, based on hours. For now. Okay. No, that, that is a good uh, approach. The, the cost of the vessel. Yeah. 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 But uh, I think the port authorities are looking for a better way, for more convenient also for them. Uh, yeah. And also one of the goals of these pilots was to see how long we can execute water injection dredging to get some knowledge, some practices. Do we need yeah. uh, one week or two weeks? And I think this knowledge is already there. So it could also right. help to, to contract a uh, dredging company. Okay. Certainly, you cannot uh, make a contract based on, on quantity of uh, of cubic meters dredged. No, no, especially not with water injection dredging and uh, uh, well, with hopper dredging operations, it's more efficient. But with water injection dredging, I don't think it's gonna happen to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Well, Alex, many questions uh, are flowing to, to our chat. Uh, I am grabbing one uh, now, then I will, we will try to cover most of them, at least, <laughs> if the time is sufficient. But there's one question coming from Gerardo Besone. Gerardo is the, the manager of the dredging department within the port of Vallablanca in Argentina, one of the largest ports in the country. And he's also where Pian can become delegate uh, from Argentina. So, Gerardo, would you like to ask Alex directly your question? I think it's, it's better. Okay, thank you, Alex. First of all, a very good presentation. Um, we've, uh, we, we've been conducting water injection dredging here in our port for the last 20 years and have had very good, uh, well, it worked fine. And also it was very much uh, 
cost efficient. The, the question is, because we've, we've considered ourselves, is uh, has Rotterdam uh, considered having its own water injection dredging equipment uh, to use uh, regularly on the berth since, uh, well, being that it's not so uh, expensive as, uh, as a trail hop uh, suction dredger, uh, and uh, and it is also cheap to operate. Uh, if you've uh, if you've looked into the uh, convenience for the port to to operate its own equipment. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you for your comments and question. Uh, it's also nice to hear that you have good experience also with port injection region in your port. Uh, for Port of Rotterdam, uh, when I was working in the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, we had discussions of developing our own water injection dredging vessels uh, because, again, uh, the mechanisms behind are not very complicated. So we need just a pump and, mm. uh, yeah, and knowledge and operational parameters that we developed also very recently. Uh, but uh, since then, uh, I'm not sure that could be an idea, but I'm not sure that port uh, will develop especially in, uh, develop their own water injection dredging vessel, especially nowadays uh, when uh, other water injection dredging vessels are available. Because recently Fanord also built uh, another two vessels and uh, it's much, e much more easier to find available water injection dredging vessels. I think we also tested uh, several vessels within our pilots. Now we know the difference and we have some understanding uh, what would be the best to apply in the port? No, I, I'm saying this because, for instance, uh, Damen has developed the equipment to to put on uh, any kind of, of vessel. So, you, you, if you have another type of vessel within the the port, you may uh, well convert it to uh, water injection dredging just by buying, as you say, the pumps and the, the pipes and so forth. Uh, uh, here we have another problems, which are, well, I don't know if, if, if it's the same problem in Holland. Uh, well, it has to do with uh, the management of the personnel because of the unions and so forth. Uh, but uh, I thought perhaps uh, Rotterdam, uh, because of its size and, and so on, uh, was, uh, well, perhaps was a, a good uh, example as, as to apply its own uh, dredging equipment? Uh, yes, yes, I agree with you. Uh, and uh, this, I think this idea was seriously discussed. Uh, however, when I left the port of Rotterdam, well, I became a scientist again <laughs> in the <laughs> university. Uh, maybe they, they are working on, uh, yeah, towards this plan, but uh, for now, uh, I'm not aware of. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, Thank you, Alex. You. Perhaps something to add on top. In Rotterdam, you have all the dredging industries around the corner. Gerardo, we are in the bottom of the world, far away. Uh, so perhaps, well, these are some, some differences. Uh, well, uh, we have another question from Fabio Zapata. He is the, the first delegate of Pian Colombia. So Fabio, would you like to, to give a question directly to Alex? Thank you, Pablo. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hi, Fabio. Uh, I'm very good. How are you? Good. Yeah, nice meeting you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question was, have you considered side, side casting dredging instead of water injection dredging uh, in some cases where there is a conditions, natural conditions with ebb tide, like really like high current created by the ebb tide or uh, ports located in the mouth, inside of the mouth of the river where you have high currents. So you will be dredging, uh, just doing the side casting of the, of the mud and, and the current will take out the mud. And let's say side casting uh, is, is cheaper than water injection dredging. Uh, yes, Fabio, thank you. thank you for your question. Uh, the main problem is uh, that uh, the port of Rotterdam uh, muddy areas, they are, they are located in a, a flood dominated uh, areas. So uh, if we 
if you conduct water injection dredging, the mud uh, cannot leave the harbor. So it's uh, mainly flood dominated if you analyze the currents. Uh, we considered also other options, but uh, for now, uh, I think conditioning uh, it looks like it's the most uh, appropriate for, for the areas uh, that, that we are testing at. They're also located at the, at the mouth, but uh, I think it's only one very little area where we could use uh, side casting or water injection dredging for, uh, for conditioning and uh, for revising the mud to the sea. Yeah. So you, you have no evaluated side casting yet? Like you have mm, not done, done any tests or any? Not, uh, not in the, those areas that we are focused on. The side casting, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we have some cases like in, in Colombia, in, in Buenaventura, where you have like high ebb, and in Barranquilla, where you have the Magdalena River, the current going out. And in those cases, uh, when you do side casting, it's, it's more convenient and cheaper than doing water injection yeah. dredging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a big ebb in that area where we're testing. Because we have the okay. river. Yeah, we have a river uh, where we made the relocation of the sediment, uh, and uh, then we have quite strong uh, ebb. Uh, but there is not no mud in that river. It's mainly sand, sandy river. Uh, the area that we were testing, if you see on the map, it's uh, located on the on the south, and uh, that's a uh, really flood dominated area. So it's, there is okay. ebb, ebb, ebb is not enough to yeah bring the mud away from that area. Yeah, and normally side casting is all, you you could use a, like an old barge or an, an old offshore supply vessel and put the equipment on the deck and 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 you you'll have a side cast side casting dredger right away. So mm -hmm. cheaper, okay. Cheaper. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, I think we have another question from one of the young professionals in Argentina, uh, Sebastián Villalba. Uh, would you like to, to open your mic and ask directly to, to Alex? Hello, Paolo. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation and it was very clear. Uh, well, I am working for one con a dredging contractor now and uh, mostly working with water injection dredgers here in Argentina. And I had a situation last year working on a project and, uh, well, I experimented myself the three stages that you, you showed in the first uh, half of uh, comparing the fluid layer with, with uh, a yogurt, with a milk, and uh, also with a, with a, uh, the pudding. That you're, uh, pudding, pudding, yes, yes. Um, we didn't have the, the equipment to, to make all the, the studies you did there. Uh, but uh, then I had some questions about the, the trials you did is, uh, for example, if you work 24 hours or during EVV, uh, if you could do a balance of the volume before and after to see if uh, the volume was the same or some of the volume left the, the control volume. And uh, also, if you know something about the pilots in the river, if uh, they experimented some uh, difference by sailing during, through this uh, mud layer or if it's the same. Uh, yeah, for, for first, uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Sebastian. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, for the volumes, uh, indeed, these density measurements, they could really help, I mean, for, for estimations of the volumes. Uh, and for, uh, for sailing through mud, uh, well, let's say uh, during our pilot, uh, th these areas were located for, I mean, sailing through mud was used already for a long time there in the port of Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, what we did with water injection dredging, we just made this food mud layer bigger, you know, and we observed mm -hmm. if, if it causes any uh, well, obstacles for, for navigation, if you have any complaints uh, from, uh, from the pilots, but uh, in the end it was quite uh, successful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, I think Port of Rotterdam implemented uh, this uh, density as a criteria in another type of, in another, another port area that was also quite problematic. 
but also based on this study. So we studied the sediment quite in, 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 in details, and we showed that the sediment is the same. Hydrodynamic conditions are slightly different, but uh, they don't really influence navigation through mud. And uh, therefore, this concept was acceptable also in the new area of the port. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I think, uh, well, we, we can close a little bit the, this session. I have one last question from, from my side, a, a very short one. Uh, but how long, Alex, did it take your research within Port of Rotterdam? And how long would you estimate replicating this procedure in other ports? In order to, to have a, a good understanding. <laughs> hey. Yeah, good question, Pablo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, I started this research in 2015 as my postdoc and also as employee of the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, however, for replicating what I see now that uh, well, port authorities and also the researchers, we prefer to work together, you know, not to replicate the whole concept in another port, but rather other port is joining, let's say, with uh, Prisma or Magnet console. Because uh, we could really profit uh, from each other's experience and knowledge. And we also have lots of activities for sharing uh, also our findings. Uh, earlier this year, we had a Magnet conference, uh, also about 120 experts from all around the world uh, joined this conference, scientists, but also, uh, also port authorities representatives. And I see that it works quite well, this exchange of knowledge, working together. Uh, it's uh, quite a uh, nice, you know, sense set of mentality for developing and testing new concepts. So I think that's okay. the preference, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that, that's good because you had some people working at uh, Port Authorities here, like Gerardo, so perhaps uh, just it rings a bell to, to join Magnet. Uh, so, well, it's a good opportunity, but so far, I think we are one minute to half past 11. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for your time. Uh, it was a very inspiring presentation, uh, opening a lot of ideas. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot, or uh, I think many of us. I hope it was an easy going for you as well. Uh, <laughs> um, well, for sure, uh, there are some pending questions in the chat, but I invite everybody to contact you directly via email. Uh, hope you are not overwhelmed with this. <laughs> but <Sounds good. laughs> uh, just, well, uh, uh, and just to conclude, thank you again. Uh, the second day is just finishing now. Uh, we see each other tomorrow. Uh, we, with the third day of the courses of Ports and Waterways. So, Alex, again, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and uh, also uh, for a very fruitful discussion and uh, also very interesting questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Have you. a good one. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye.